Today's guest at the Rock House is Simon Hosford. When we looked at promoting Simon's interview, my editor for the Rock House Mag just simply called him the guitar god. And when I spoke to a close mate and said that I was interviewing Simon Hosford, his words were, wow, that guy is seriously a good guitar player. I don't think I can do a better intro than that, Simon. So welcome to the Rock House. How are you, mate? The guitar <laughs> god himself. Uh, not guitar guard at all, but thank you, Jack. That's a very flattering intro, and uh, the check will be in the mail for sure. No problem, <laughs> <laughs> mate. Before we get on to uh, your musical career, because it's you know it's just such a fantastic time that you've had in in music. You also have a successful podcast, and and recently you ran your top five albums as part of that podcast. What were those top five albums? Well, let's see if I can re remember them because then this will really prove to you whether they are indeed my top five albums or... Um, so I think... Um, uh, look, this list is probably going to surprise a couple of people, but there was a Prince record in there, which, oh, which was... One? Sorry, what's that? Which one? It'd have to be Purple Rain or 1999, I think. No, it actually wasn't. It was... Um, I think it's the symbol. It's just called the symbol album. So it's the one with uh sexy mf my name is prince uh yeah. was you, like a what's that sign of the times on that album no i yeah. think sign of the times yeah, i'm going to expose my my, uh, my fails with with prince here but i think that might be on diamonds and pearls but no this is the one uh i think it came out in about 92 yeah so, um, and you know, and we can talk about why, uh, why these top five, if you like in a bit, but I'll go through the top five first. Um, uh, as far as like a rock album, I've got to say that I think that Skid Row's Slave to the Grind is oh. one of the, one of the, one of the greatest rock albums ever. And, um, I know that, you know, their kind of status as a, uh, amongst all of the massive, massive, massive heavyweights like ACDC, Black Sabbath, you know, uh, Van Halen, I made and all these other bands, people might not put them quite on that in that same echelon. But to me, I mean, I listened to that album a lot when it came out, and it's still a record that I can listen to and, and crank in my headphones to this day. And I just think that it's a really amazing mix of aggression and yep. and still some kind of pop. A slight, you know, like that melodic kind of thing that they had on their first record. I think the first record's really great for a debut record too, but I think Slave to the Grind to me, that's got a special place in my heart because that was when I was finishing high school when that came out and I just listened to that all the time and it just, it, you know, it's got some songs in there that really revved me up and still to this day, like if I'm maybe getting ready for a gig and I need to like boost my energy a bit, I'll put the headphones in and I'll just crank uh, you know, living on a chain gang or something off that record, you know, Classic. So, Classic. yeah, yeah. So, so that's one of them. Um, man, I haven't revisited this since the podcast episode. So let's see. Uh, I don't know if you've got it in my answers in front of you, but I'm going to have to try and remember this now. Oh, one is by a, um, I guess you'd call her like an R and B funk woman called Michelle and Dega Cello. And, uh, she's, uh, like a African American bass player, but that uh, that writes her own songs, does her own production. Uh, I believe even plays some of the drums on on the records, and her vocals are just like move like silky, like honey, you know, um, like almost in the same way. Like if someone hasn't heard her, but they've heard Katie Lang, uh, that that kind of just smooth mid rangey. Anyway, that that album. I had to pick my top five, maybe not based on what I was most influenced by, because I think anyone that's heard me play would would figure that I'm not really influenced as a guitarist by that kind of music. Yeah, yeah. But for me, for me, it simply just comes down to the number of plays, you know, and that that album I, I would have listened to, and I'm not exaggerating, probably nearly a thousand times by now. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and, and any of these records would be the same. Like we're talking about Skid Row, Slave to the Grind. I mean, I couldn't even count how many times I listened to that. Um, certainly back when it came out, I listened to it like nonstop for oh. a, year or, a year or two. And it was, um, 
it was an album that I just left in my car at the time. So anytime I stepped in the car and turned the ignition on, Sebastian like Bach and the boys were just slapping me in the face. <laughs> and I used to, and I used to do that thing that, that now that I'm a bit older, I realize it's super annoying. But because I was in my 20s, I just have all all the windows down and have the car just absolutely bouncing along to the kick drum and and it, of course, at the time, I thought that was super tough and super cool. Yeah. And now that I'm a bit older, I realized, oh, dude, roll your windows up, you know, <laughs> like, please. I'm still guilty of putting the windows down, don't worry, and letting the yeah, air yeah. in. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Well, you know, I mean, I don't have any hair. So, so for me, I like putting the windows down and feeling the wind in my head, you know. But um, so that's um, uh, so. So the album, if anyone's curious to check any of these out, and please do, uh, even if you're a rock guitarist or whatever, <clears throat> the reason that I've listened to these albums so much isn't, <clears throat> excuse me, isn't because they're rock or not rock. It's because overall, I feel like every element of the making of that record, so the songwriting, I think is 10 out of 10. I think the performances are 10 out of 10. I think the production, like the choices they make with like what instruments and where and all of that stuff is 10 out of 10. And then I also think the mix and the mastering is 10. So, I mean, these are all albums that to me sound amazing too. So even if you're not into that style of music, you know, it, it'll make your stereo sound the best that it's ever sounded, you know. <clears throat> um, okay, what else was there? There would have been, oh, I think I picked one. Now, this one's... If you, if you thought Michelle and Dege Cello is left of centre, this one's crazy yep. left of centre, but it's an album that just gives me so much happiness and it's simply um, a live recording of Chick Corea on piano and Bobby McFerrin, believe it or not, which yeah. most, peop most people would know from his Don't Worry, Be Happy song. Don't Worry, Be Happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think everybody knows that. But, but actually what people don't know about Bobby is he's actually quite the musical genius. And yeah. that was just one of, don't worry, be happy was kind of like, you know, extremes more than words or Mr. Big's um, uh, to be with you, you know, where like you're basically, you've got one track on the album that, you know, you're hoping is going to get radio play around the world. And then the rest of the tracks you do whatever the hell you want. And, um, and so what it is, is it's just Chick Corea and Bobby McFerrin, just the two of them on stage in, uh, you know, in a, a theatre hall in, I can't remember which city, but somewhere, you know, New York maybe or somewhere, um, playing to a, a live audience of a couple of thousand people and with no rehearsal, none. Wow. Wow. All, they, all they did was choose the 10 songs that they were going to do for this gig and then they walked out on stage and the two of them, just piano and voice, are just, it's one of the greatest examples of what, to me, musicians do greatest which is improvising and then playing playing off another person live on stage which of course all great bands do you know everyone's <laughs> always listening to each other so the drummer goes to a, a certain say in a rock band drummer goes to a certain feel and the rest of the band can almost anticipate and imagine what that how the phrasing of that feel is going to end up so they catch it with like a lick or something yeah, yeah. to me that's one of the most fun parts of of playing live is that that spontaneity you know and this album is, it's really just a bunch of jazz standards and the ones that everyone would know, like Autumn Leaves, uh, Spain, you know, a whole bunch of stuff like that. But if you're curious, check it out. It's one of those ones where like put on the kettle, put the headphones on because it sounds glorious and yeah. you will hear some of the most amazing music that was unrehearsed. So, and that was very deliberate. They said, let's see what happens if we just go out on stage in front of 2,000 people and all we've done is choose the songs. And uh, the result to me is, is one of the greatest musical things that I've ever listened to. So that in terms of like absolute genius yeah. or, or captured on a record, that's one of my top five for sure. Awesome. Um, and the final uh, one? The final one's prob probably another surprising one for anyone that's, that knows me a little bit, but um, definitely not as left of center as, as that last one. By the way, the album, if you want to check it out, is it's Bobby McFerrin and Chick Corea, and the album is called Play. Okay. So, um, is an album from not that many years ago, maybe five or six, and it's, it's Ariana Grande's Dangerous Woman. Wow. And um, some people might know, but I think not everyone would know that even though she's like an American pop songstress, you know, that kind of the new, 
the new guard of what used to be, you know, Whitney Houston and then Mariah Carey and, and she sort of fits in Christina Aguilera. Um, but what you've got to remember is all these songs are written and produced by Max Martin in Sweden, who's just like you and me. He's, a, he's, a, he's an old rock dog from the 80s. And so the whole album, even though it doesn't have big guitars and big drums, you could, you could play, you could, and I do this all the time, sometimes when I'm just goofing off at home in the lounge room and sitting on the couch with my guitar, I'll put that record on and I'll just solo rock stuff all through that record. And you can, because you can tell when you're listening to it, you're going, oh, this was, there's something about the sensibility and the production of it that um, you can tell comes from a core of a rock heart, you know? And then, you know, no matter what you think of female pop song stresses, Ariana's vocal ability is, she, is, is that, she's amazing. She is the same level of impressiveness to me as any of our guitar heroes are on guitar, whether it's, whether it's Hendrix, Van Halen, Malmsteen, it does you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, doesn't matter who you choose. She vocally is at that level. And so when you pair that up with someone writing and producing that basically is an 80s rock guitarist. To me, that's kind of like, if I'm gonna to listen to a modern pop thing, that's what, that's what I would want. I want someone like me, you know, like a rock guy kind of doing all the, the heavy lifting, but then a singer out the front that can sing anything in the same yeah. way that, you know, we love Sebastian Bach because he can sing anything, you know? Yeah. Crazy. Um, Crazy. And he's, he's absolutely one of my favorite all time rock singers. He is, uh, I'd have to say he's in my top three without even thinking necessarily who the other two are. It's just his voice is nuts. And, um, and that's a big part of why I love Slave to the Grind too. So we've got right. uh, Skid Row, Slave to the Grind, Bobby McFerrin and Chick Corea play, Michelle and Degacello, that album is called Peace Beyond Passion. Is that particular record I'm thinking of? Okay. Uh, then we had, well, we have Ariana Grande, Dangerous Woman. And Prince symbol and prince the symbol and so and so when i came up with that list obviously i i, I wouldn't have listened to the prince one for a while like quite a few years but i just remember that i, I mean that that stayed on a cassette in my car this is back when when cars yeah. and cassette, cassette cassette players in them you um, always used to have to carry a pen when you played a cassette in the car mate just uh, that's really right cool. yeah. well i well i had this old um datsun 180b box wagon but yeah, but yeah. but and i wish i still had it because it would be a collector's item now and it was yeah, in it, mint, it was in mint condition and it was sky blue and it had been lowered it had cool wheels on it it was such a cool car it only had four gears though so driving on the freeway you were just almost redlining the whole time but i ended up putting like a you know a really good kenwood system in it and um <laughs> which was a which the best one at the during the day was yeah. a cassette one and so that Prince album on cassette, it, I, I had it double sided, and it, I used to have the auto reverse. So every time it finished one side, it would just click over and play the other one. And so I didn't, I didn't even take that cassette out for I think at least two years. So, yeah. so that's why for me, even though I wouldn't have listened to it for a long time now, I can just tell that that songwriting and those parts and stuff are sort of part of my DNA, you know. And every now and again when I'm doing a guitar session, it could even be a blues or a rock guitar session. I'll, I'll play a lick. If someone says, oh, can you do some fills and play a solo? I'll do a lick where I'll go, oh, that's straight off that Prince song, damn you or something. And I'll know that, that that's how much I've listened to it. That even though I never worked any of those songs out, they're just in the subconscious, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. It's, it's interesting, a real diverse mix, um, probably, some of those albums go on the uh, playlist here. Definitely Slave to the Grind comes on. Yeah. But when my daughter's here, she turns off Skid Row, mate, and puts on Ariana Grande. So oh. very fun. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And and does uh, does your daughter have a go-to Ariana album or is it just sort of uh, a playlist oh, of, of all the stuff? Uh, yeah, no, she probably does. She she does actually play quite a bit of a, a mix. She hey, hey Jock, I've, I've got to ask you, do you have do you have a multi-track uh, set up at, at at your place, whether it's Pro Tools or Logic or anything else? No, I don't, mate. No, I don't. Definitely looking at getting some, though. I was going to ask, if you know some, even if you know somebody that does, yeah. after this, I'll, I'll upload you something I've got in my Dropbox 
that'll give you a, just the most hugest appreciation. So all it is, I don't know if I should really say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I found, <laughs> I found from a really dodgy Russian website, you know, the kind of website that if you click on anything will crash your computer, like that yes. dodgy. No, and, a few of those websites in my time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so have we all. But, um, you know, so, so on my, um, uh, I don't know if you use Apple stuff, but on my Apple laptop, it, it, it's, it's, I've got all the um, security settings super sensitive. So I was getting like um, flip up window or flip up window after like messages saying, please do not click on this website. Please do not click. But what was on there, someone had taken the multi-tracks to all the individual files of that particular Ariana album and uploaded them. So someone, it must've been a, a assistant engineer that was working in the studio or something, took them all off a hard drive and uploaded them. So her biggest hit off that record, which was like I said, another Max Martin written and produced thing called Into You, which was number one all around the world. I've got the, I've got the multi-tracks off it that if you know someone with a studio and we can do is go and solo each part and then it's the, it's the most amazing looking behind the curtain of how these pop songwriters <laughs> write this stuff because what that song is, which you can't hear in the, in the finished mix but is there, is the drum beat to Billie Jean. So essentially what that song is, is they've started it with a number one hit, Billie Jean, and then just built different things <clears throat> on top of it. And the middle eight, there's, a, there's some little bits of thriller thrown in as well. Oh, wow. So, wow. But it's fat. It's fascinating. And some people might go, oh, well, if you've, if you've taken a sample of Michael Jackson's Billie Jean and taken a sample of Michael Jackson's Thriller, you're not really songwriting. But the truth is you can't hear those things in the finished mix, but you can tell that that was probably how they started the songwriting session that day. They said, well, why don't we do something with the groove of Billie, Billie Jean? Because everyone subconsciously knows that, dun, 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 you know? Anyway, um, I'll be ha happy to send you a link to it, brother. And, um, and if you've... If you got someone that can pull it up, um, yeah. Yeah, definitely so. check it out. Uh, definitely, definitely. Awesome. It's interesting awesome. how you constructed that top five. You talk about the production, the songwriting, and the instruments that they chose. I'm going to throw something in there and say the emotions that the music invokes as well. And I think hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you know, I, I've got a top five. Some similarities, some differences, but you know, it all comes down to the emotion that is, is invoked for me. Well, actually, out of, out of my personal curiosity, what's your top five? Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, definitely, uh, look, I've got a rock background um, and grew up at a similar time with you, um, with the 80s becoming big. A lot of my albums come from that time. Um, yep. The first one would be uh, Wasp Inside the Electric Circus. That was probably my introduction to Wasp and Blackie Lawless hates the album. I love it. Um, of yeah, we... we Sorry, we were talking uh, just, uh, you know, in the green room, so to speak, uh, but before the show about, I mean, I, I used to love listening to Wasp as well. I, and um, I guess we, we would be talking about probably, what, 1986 or seven, something, something that's mid eighties, right? We'd be talking yep. roughly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I love that, that album with uh, Blind in Texas, LOV, Love Machine. Uh, yep. All that stuff, yeah, yeah, love. Yeah. I love that yeah. record, mate. Their first four or five albums are fantastic, and Blackie and the band are still releasing some quality stuff as well. But my go-to album uh, is the first album that introduced me to Wasp. Uh, Opeth, Ghost Reveries is probably really high up there. Um, out cool. the 80s, but really love Opeth. Uh, Mike Ackerfeld, just an amazing musician, and his vocals would just blow anyone away. Um, live and as well in the studio setting uh van halen 1984 would have to be a great, re great record i should say some people might be crazy surprised that there's not one van halen album in my top five because i know you're a huge eddie fan mate. so massive yeah. eddie fan but before before you get back to your other three i'll just quickly say about that that the reason is the first time i ever heard van halen was a compilation tape that my guitar teacher had given me when I was 12 years old. And it had, so it had songs from Van Halen, one, two, women and children first, you know, and went all the way through up to the album 5150. So I even had a, some snippets of some Sammy stuff. And at the yeah. time, cause I'd never seen them uh, in magazines or MTV or whatever. 
I didn't even realize that the songs of 5150 was a different singer. It sounded a bit different, but then so that album sounded so different that I just thought, oh, yeah. this album sounds different, you know? Um, and so for me, if I was going to pick, put Van Halen in my top five, I'd have to say as a compilation record, it'd be everything from Van Halen 1 to 5150 because because I didn't grow up with individual albums, it's too hard for me to pick one Van Halen album. I just can't yeah. do it. But, but 1984 is a great record. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's awesome. LA Guns, Cocked and Loaded. Uh, it was their oh, second. yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just for some reason, love it. Um, you know, it's a toss-up between their debut album, which is pure sleaze metal, if I can say, from the LA scene. But the second album was probably a little bit more polished um and then rounded it out the faster pussycat debut album mate so <laughs> just awesome a, a great party band yeah yeah well i haven't listened to some of that stuff for a long time jock but now that uh, you laid out your top five i'm gonna do that i'm gonna i'm yeah. gonna go back and have a listen to those records yeah, with, yeah. you know so because i'm gonna listen five. to them yeah i'm gonna listen to them with completely different ears now than than you know when i was a teenager yeah. yeah, I mean, that top five is off the top of my head. There's probably better quality albums that should be in there, mate. But if you talk about the emotions that are stirred, they are, they are my top five that I would go to. It's all about the emotions. And the same thing for me. Like, now I can look back, because I've done so much work in the studio, mixing and producing and stuff, and I look back and I go, wow, interestingly, that for me, a lot of, a lot of the ones I picked also are great, greatly produced records. <laughs> But truthfully, at the, at the time when I was listening to them, I wasn't thinking that stuff at all. All it was is that I was listening to it nonstop, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I guess you, I guess you're doing that because of the way it makes you feel. Because all music is, is sound waves that make you feel something emotionally, right? So whether that it makes you feel pumped up or it makes you feel aggression or it makes you feel melancholy or it makes you feel loving, but it's all just a feeling, you know. Yeah, yeah, nice stuff. I still, mate, we could talk about our top five albums all day, but <laughs> we are actually here to talk about your career as well. Uh, before we move on, where can, where can your fans find your podcast and what is it? Okay, so um, I'm a part of a podcast that's actually based out of New Zealand and run by an awesome charismatic guy called Andrew Walton, and it's called The 5150 Show. So if anyone's on YouTube and they Google The 5150 Show, uh, that'll come straight up. As you would gather from the title, gives away the fact that it's a Van Halen centralised kind of topic podcast. Occasionally it goes other places, but it's mostly it's mostly about Van Halen. And uh, Andrew's actually been running it for a while. It's his podcast. But uh, I was fortunate enough that um, uh, we were chatting, you know, on, on, on Messenger and, and, and yeah. stuff like that. And, and we sort of became friends and... Uh, and then he asked one day, he said, look, you know, if you wanted to be a part of the show, we'd love to have you. And so that top five album episode you're talking about would have been probably one of my first because I think that they saw it as a good way of a let's get to know Hoss kind of thing, you know. And I think uh, reading some of the live comments as, as I was talking about some of those records, people were just going, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not Van Halen 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. How can that not be the, you know, but... um. Yeah, but, but like I said, I mean, uh, I think the best way for me to, to, and before just quickly before we move on from the top five, is all of Van Halen's catalogue is like the core, like the sun, and then the top five albums that I picked are like the planets going around the sun. You know, yeah. that's probably the, that's why I didn't mention Van Halen, but yeah, so there you go. There you go. That's a good so, analogy. So that's the podcast, yeah, if anyone wants to check that out. Um, Andrew's a, a classic and very funny and, uh, and it's a good light podcast that delves into whatever's happening in the, you know, the Van Halen world at the moment. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Let's talk about your career, mate. Um, sure. Virgil Donati is a special name to you that um, comes up. Virgil, originally from Southern Suns started up his own band, a rock fusion band called On The Verge. That was probably your first big break, right? Yeah, I would say so. So I was pretty young at the time. I was just turning 19. And um, like all of these things in life, I mean, I've had a lot of guitar students and stuff ask me, like, how did you get the gig with this person? How did you get the gig with that person? And because, as you say, this is one of my first big gigs, the answer to it simply is it's just, 
it, well, it's two things really, but mostly it's who you know. But obviously, the only reason that someone you know recommends you to somebody else is because you put in a lot of hours. And, you know, as a kid, I just spent most of my time playing guitar, you know, more than doing other things. So, um, so that came about because uh, a friend of mine in high school who was a year above me was already at, at Melbourne Uni and doing the music course yeah. and, was, and was playing with uh, Phil Tercio, who, who, of course, is the keyboard player for On The Verge. And, um, and Phil had been dog, do, dogging Vir, Virgil for, uh, for years, sending him demo cassettes saying, please, can I do, can we do a gig together? Please, can we do a gig together? That kind of thing. And, um, you know, Virgil was playing drums with Southern Sons, which, of course, we all know Jack Jones was, was yep. fronting. And, um, and I think they were taking a break or something and between recording albums and Virgil wanted to do some serious playing. Uh, Virgil did have, a, have another fusion band long before Southern Sons called Loose Change um, with some amazing players in it too. But um, what Virgil didn't want to do is, is use the same lineup. He wanted to do something with all new guys, maybe a different sound. So he ended up contacting Phil Tercio, uh, who'd been, you know, who had a box of cassettes from and said, all right, let's get together and, and jam. So I think the two of them just played together first in a rehearsal studio. Um, and Virgil said, this is awesome. Let's, let's do something. What guitarist do you know? And at the time, he'd had my mate from high school just in his ear going, man, you've got to play with Simon Hosford. You've got to play with Simon. But Phil didn't know me from anything. He's like, no, no, I don't even know who he is. But anyway, we got together. We had a, an informal kind of <clears throat> jam, like uh, myself, Phil, Virgil, and an bass, amazing bass player called Every Petey's, um, who actually grew up as a classical guitarist. So he can play stuff with all his fingers with the right hand on the on a six string bass that I can't I mean I grew up on classical guitar as well um but he can play stuff on a six string bass that I can't even play on a nylon string guitar so he's like fully on another level we had an informal rehearsal and um Virgil liked it I guess it really was an audition but it was kind of a jam um and then uh and then on the verge was was born and uh and we did lots of gigs around mainly around Melbourne uh, and wrote all our own stuff. Of course, we threw in covers of all sorts of different things, whether it was old Chick Corea Return to Forever stuff or Jeff Beck or, yeah, yeah. So, um, and, 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 some, and some newer things too. You know, if there was a new album that came out that Verge was digging, uh, we'd do some of that. And anyway, so we recorded our, uh, our record in, I think it was 90, mm, I'm going to get this wrong. I think it was 98. We recorded Serious Young Insects, which is, um, if anyone hasn't heard on The Verge, you can you can find that easily online. It's that album's on Spotify and iTunes and stuff. So, okay. but that was so that was a bunch of all originals that we did with with um, that album, and um, and then not that long after we recorded and released the album, Virgil went to live permanently in Los Angeles. So, um, so the band was was kind of no more. But we, um, for the 20th anniversary of an event in Melbourne called the Australian Ultimate Drummers Weekend, which uh, Drum Tech hosts every year, and they get, I mean, you know, all, all the amazing drummers. It could be uh, Simon Phillips, Mike Portnoy. Um, wow. You know, you get the idea. Like Vinny Colliuto, it doesn't matter. Like all, all the top tier drummers. Um, and for the 20th anniversary, what they really wanted is they said to Virgil, could you please put On The Verge back together just for like a special concert for the 20th anniversary and we'll film it and release it as a DVD. Um, so that's what we did. So that was actually about 10 years ago now, but that was the last time we played together. Um, wow. but, it, but if anyone is curious and hasn't heard or seen any of that stuff, you can actually watch the whole concert on my YouTube channel. So okay. It's, yeah, it's up there. So. Definitely, definitely worth a look. Then I, I wasn't aware of that. My I, my researcher has failed me, mate. So I should have watched. It. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. It hasn't actually been up for that long. Like it's it's probably only been on my channel for six months or something. So, oh, there you go. Um, yeah, we'll, but yeah, we'll but, but if anyone wants to, is uh, I mean, it's not for everyone. It's instrumental heavy metal jazz, I would yeah. call it. So, and it's most of it's odd time and and you know 
we're sort of stretching the, the limits of functional harmony a little bit here and there. But uh, for anyone that, lo that loves that stuff that's really proggy, like I would say the closest thing it sounds to is like maybe like dream theater, but with no vocals, that yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that's, um, but gr growing up playing with Virgil was amazing because, because I was so young, having to deal with that kind of music and like, you know, um, and we did, we pretty much ran nothing with click tracks back then. So there's just four people on stage trying to play in these crazy time signatures together. And it really was a trial by fire for me. Like it was the three of them, Virgil, Phil and Every, were quite frankly on a different level that I was at when I was 19. I was just lucky that they heard something in me that they thought, okay, we'll steer this ship, but we need you on it. You know, I, I think actually what they might have liked about me is because I came from more of a straight ahead rock Angus Young, Van, Eddie Van Halen kind of playing style. I wasn't doing all the, I, I sounded more rock than I sounded jazz rock, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I, and I think that, that that made their jazziness have a bit more edge. So anyway, it, it worked out really well, but yeah, that was, that was pretty intense, but I'm really, for, I'm really glad for it because it, it really made me lift. Like I had to practice a lot back in those days, just to even play some of the melodies I had to practice. That's yeah. how crazy some of that stuff is. But, yeah, lots of fun. Awesome. It obviously played well for you, mate, because you then joined Tommy Emmanuel on his tour. And, you know, as a young guitar player, what greater mentor could you have than Tommy Emmanuel when you toured with him? None. None greater is the answer to that question. Um, Tommy is... <sighs> Look, all I could do is use the words of Steve Vai. Uh, Steve Vai has called him the greatest guitarist in the world. So, yeah. I mean, coming from someone at Steve's level, that's something. In fact, he backed it up by signing Tommy to his label, record label. Um, but Tommy is, uh, was a session dog in the 70s and the 80s. And then, of course, as everyone knows, started releasing his own records. Tommy's level of ability is, is on a level like I've just never seen. But it isn't just that. Tommy is, I was asked a question just a couple of weeks ago, like, is Tommy um, a perfectionist? And I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. It's, he's, a, he's got very high standards, but I wouldn't call him a perfectionist. His level of ability comes from that he just never, ever puts the guitar down. It's as simple as that. I mean, and when I say never, I almost mean never. I mean, other than showering and eating and just whatever little social things that, that a human being has to do, um, you know, I, I toured with Tommy lots over the years in bits and pieces, but we particularly did one long three-month tour around Europe where we were doing it all on the, the touring coach, you know, where you've got your, your 12 bunks in the middle of the coach and you're basically sleeping on the bus while the driver drives overnight and doing that stuff. And that was great because we were playing to these little theatres that seated anywhere from, you know, 1,000 to 2,000. And... Um, but so a typical day, to give you an idea when I say he never puts the guitar down, the day I'm about to just quickly outlay when he would do this every day for three months. It would be, you'd wake up in the morning on the bus as you were still coming into whatever city in Germany or something, and you would hear acoustic guitar playing from six in the morning, no, no exaggeration, which is fine because I'm an early riser and that some people are, but not when you're going to bed at 12 or one you know, and the reason that you can't sleep before 12 or 1, because after the concert, when we get back on the bus to drive overnight to wherever, yes. Tommy's, Tommy's got the acoustic out and he's jamming for like two yeah. hours. Just, yeah, yeah. Just playing and, and trying new ideas and writing a new song, like whatever it is. So eventually that'll stop at around 1 o'clock. But then at 6 in the morning, you hear acoustic guitar again. And you'll hear that acoustic guitar for the next couple of hours. Then we get to the venue or the city that we're playing at. We will um, we'll go find some breakfast or lunch somewhere. And then we pretty much load in straight away. Sound check, which can take up to two hours, as everyone knows, when, when you're setting up from scratch. So two hour sound check. Then Tommy would go and do a meet and greet after sound check. Then but after the meet and greet, he'd do a one and a half hour workshop with whoever was at the meet and greet that brought their acoustic guitars with them. Right. So a really informal kind of so he would do that for an hour and a half and teach teach people for essentially for free. You know, he'd do this everywhere he went. 
because he's just such a giver, you know. We'd have dinner, do a two-hour show, shower, get back on the bus, he'd get his acoustic guitar back out. And that, and that's, and that was at the age of 60 something. So I mean, that's the level of passion. So when when people talk about what kind of experience for me, which is going back to your question, is it to tour with and play work with someone like Tommy? Um, he's one of the most generous, kind-hearted people. And as a musician and as a guitarist sharing the stage with him, it's both exhilarating and completely frightening and depressing at the same time. <laughs> because <laughs> Because no, no matter what things that I'd pull, I mean, there'd be a moment towards the end of the concerts where we would cut heads yeah. and he'd, he'd be on his mate and acoustic and I'd be on electric with, you know, with my distortion pedals and stuff. And um, he, he would be out, I did, keep, keep his ideas flowing longer than I could. I would run out of a bag of tricks and he would still be coming up with licks that I didn't even hear him play in the last two weeks on tour. Like, it's just a bottomless pit of ideas. And basically, you know, I mean, he could, he can out chop people on an electric guitar on an acoustic guitar. He's, he's really that amazing. But, you know, what he chooses to do mostly is play his style of solo acoustic stuff, and yeah. which is somewhat jazz influenced, but also somewhat country guitar influenced. Yeah. And then somewhat just straight out pop influence, you know, like some of his, his ballads that he writes that he plays on acoustic guitar where he does the bass line, the chords and the melody yeah. really could just be a, a pop ballad, you know. Um, no, I used to watch uh, Hey Hey It's Saturday and he was a regular on there and you would just be amazed mm. just watching him play. You go, wow, how does anyone yeah. become good? And it's quite obvious. He just plays that, all day. That's it. That honestly, uh, um, that would be the same thing that I'd say to anyone. Um, you know, occasionally I'll get a student that'll say, okay, so how do you get like really, really good? Like, what do I have to do? And more than any specific thing, obviously there's specific things you can do to build your technique or your, your, um, your mastery of music harmony and theory. And, and so you can write a song and know what you're doing, but really more than anything is, is, um, I like a question that as a guitar teacher, I'll sometimes get asked is how much should I practice each day? And I'll just tell them, well, that's up to you. I can't yeah. tell you how to do that. The real, but if you really want this really bad and you listen to someone like Tommy and you want to be that good, then the question isn't how much do I practice each day? It's do I really have to stop practicing to have dinner? It becomes that you've got to flip it around. It's like it, the question becomes, when do I have to stop so that I don't pass out? You know, because that's what that's what Tommy's like. That's actually what Virgil Donati's like too. He's just yeah. he's always yeah. in his hotel room with his kick drum pedals, and and there's no such thing as putting Netflix on for these guys. You know, they just the, the minute they check into the hotel, Virgil will be drumming on his bed until the gig. You know, and Tommy will be playing acoustic guitar in his room until the gig, and that's the gig. that's what it that, that's what it takes. Yeah, it was interesting. I was around. Uh out for dinner on Saturday night and um, a friend of my son's and this friend is learning how to play guitar and he goes, oh, I just wish I could get better. I think this interview, mate, will show him how to get better. Okay, good, yeah. good. <laughs> From Tommy, uh, you moved over to Men at Work and did a lot of work with those guys as well. Yeah. Um, and if anyone's curious, like, so how did you get the Tommy gig after you were doing such different music with Virgil yeah. Donati, again, all I would say is it's just um, one thing leads to another. And it's, so it's just about building a network um, of, of people that have worked with you or employed you or whatever it is. Um, yeah. You know, in the, in the green room before you are mentioning some of my recording stuff and bachelor girl was something that came up yeah. well, believe it or believe it or not from playing guitar on bachelor girls first record. That's how I got the Tommy Emmanuel gig of all things. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be quite random. Um, how I got the Men at Work gig was again through my high school buddy, James, who, you know, through Phil Tercio, I ended up getting the gig with Virgil. So both Men at Work and, and Virgil Tonati, which are polar opposites, came from essentially a high school mate. So um, it's funny, you know, you, You've got to nurture your, your friendships and your contacts when you're young, if you can, because you just never know. I was doing a workshop for Elfin College the other week and I was getting a lot of those kind of questions like, how did this happen? How did that happen? And when I really look back, I can trace most of it back to one or two people that really believed in me when I was 18, 17, 18, 
So um, the idea that that your your contacts, your network, and your friendships, even when you're a teenager, don't matter because you because you're going to finish school and you're going to go then go out and conquer the world. It's amazing that it just matters all the time, you know. Yeah. But the the men at work thing was great. So it was the first time that they had played together. This was '96, um, really since they broke up in the '80s. Um, and the first bunch of tours we did were all in South America. It was all like the oh, first wow. one was was five weeks just in Brazil. Wow. And that was, and I was only 21 at the time. So that was quite an eye opener because the Brazilians are crazy. And I mean, they're crazy good, you know, their, their passion for life, um, their, their passion for music, their passion for going out and drinking and dancing and all these things. I mean, that was just wild. I mean, so to give you an idea of the, the kind of shows we were doing, we did Sao Paulo three nights in a row to 10,000 people. Like they were big gigs. Um, because Men at Work had never toured there, but they were number one there in the 80s. Yep. So it was really like a band coming for the first time. So that was so that was an amazing experience. And then over the years, I toured with them uh, a bit more. Um, we did some runs again around South America, but not just Brazil. We went all around and we did a run around the States as well. Um, but yeah, and we actually ended up recording a, a live album in Brazil called, uh, just actually called Live in Brazil. Um, so that's great to be a part of that because, I mean, I grew up with those first two Minute Records, uh, Minute Work Records because my, my parents had them on, on vinyl, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So getting asked to do that, it, it was kind of cool. Obviously, I mean, I wanted the gig because I liked the songs, but even though, I mean, I was coming really from a much more rock background than Minute Work, but I knew all those guitar parts subconsciously like the back of my hand because I used to play my parents' vinyl when I was in primary school. So um, by the time that, that I got asked if I would do it, I really didn't have to learn that much because I knew all these songs. I'd, I'd already memorized them. So I, bit, I probably had a bit of an unfair advantage for whoever else they auditioned. But um, uh, I think they were worried because Colin Hay was about, I think he was about 40 at the time. Yeah. And I was... And I was only just about to turn 20. So I think they were worried it might be a bit of a disconnect, you know, to have someone half the age of the other guys in the band. But um, uh, luckily enough, I, I got the chance and, and we, we had some real fun. So, yeah, and to this day, uh, Colin Hay and I are, are great friends and, and, yeah. and keep in touch. And yeah. For anyone, actually, Colin's... Uh, coming out to Australia just in a few oh, weeks. Wow. And, and I think what he's doing is a solo acoustic run, um, which might, uh, you know, maybe to your audience might not sound like their cup of tea, but I promise you him on acoustic playing all these amazing songs and obviously some of the men at work ones as well. His voice is sounds the same as when he oh. was, is when he's in his thirties, but also what Colin does when he isn't playing touring with the band, it's just him. In between the songs, he basically he tells like road stories and stuff, and and he's such a great storyteller that I promise it's a great night out for anyone that hasn't seen him do a solo acoustic gig. It's really cool, mate. I'm sure you've got a few uh, stories from the road, particularly as a 20 year old in, in uh, Brazil, mate. But we'll leave that for another time. <laughs> yeah, that could, that can be a separate podcast. But yes, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, you know. Uh, but it was great. It was it. Um, you know, that period of my life, you know, from 19 working with Virgil and then a year later doing Minute Work in South America. I mean, every, pretty much every single thing I was doing was a brand new experience, either musically or in life, you know. Um, yeah. So I was very fortunate, for sure. Speaking of good fortune, um, following the Minute Work gig, you then joined Virgil Shorik and Goebel, uh, formerly known as the Little River Band. You know, you've gone from one legendary um australian act to another how did that gig land hmm that one also came from sort of in a lot more roundabout way but came via doing the bachelor girl recording um yeah. okay so because graham gobel was looking around for uh, some you know some good session players too because they knew that they couldn't couldn't and maybe slash didn't want to i don't know use the original members or maybe some of the original members just weren't interested again, you know? Um, so they're looking for essentially a new rhythm section to go behind their vocals. 
and uh, and I got recommended, and I can't. I think we just same thing really. We just rehearsed a few songs, um, and Graham really liked the the lineup that he put together, and so we ended up uh, going around the country a few times, and we also ended up recording a live DVD at the Forum in Melbourne called um, Full Circle. Okay. So. Which, which was great. I mean, there's snippets of that that you can find uh, on YouTube and stuff as well. So, I but yeah, touring. I think that, have that on DVD, so I might have to check that out. You have it on DVD? Uh, I think my father does, yeah. So. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, was, that was great. And again, that was a situation just like Men at Work where, um, you know, my parents had a lot of those LRB records and so so for me getting asked to do that was like oh cool i already know how up this stuff goes and of course i liked it you know because whatever you listen whatever you grow up listening to even if it's not the style of music you end up really playing it's still part of you somehow you know it sort of shaped your shaped your music somehow yeah definitely mate you've just gone from strength to strength and if you look at some of the other australian acts that you've uh, played with you're currently on tour with daryl braithwaite Vanessa Amorossi, Taxi Ride, John Stevens, Shannon Noll, and Anthony Clare. You know, all great Australian acts as well. What are your fondest memories from those tours? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, look, I mean, for the last couple of years, I guess since sort of COVID, I've been sort of guitar, uh, Daryl Braithwaite's right-hand man on guitar. It's really a pleasure playing with Daryl. He's, um, I mean, he's such a great singer, sings as great as ever. The songs are all really good, happy pop songs. Everyone knows his songs, you know, Horses, of course, but then there's, you know, One Summer and As the Days Go By. And, yeah. um, any any a, songs from... Uh, there is. Yeah. No, there's quite a lot. Yeah, we do a lot of the old Sherbet stuff. Obviously, we do How's That. We'd get lynched if we, if we didn't play How's That. Oh, um, <laughs> but there's, um, you know, we do other like Blues Walking and Summer Love and... Um, uh, some of the others are escaping me right now, but yeah. So it's a, it's a, the set is a mixture of his solo album stuff from the eighties, but also of course the old Sherbet uh, big songs. And it's just a pleasure to play that stuff because it's, it's part of the Australian music catalog, I guess you could say as much as men at work and everything else. And, um, and Daryl's such a sweet, sweet guy to work with as well. So yeah. Um, yeah. Th that, that always makes a difference. Not everyone, that employs you as an artist is is easy to work with, but okay. So um, favorite other memories? I don't know. I've been, uh, I mean, we've met at work. We did the the closing ceremony of the, the Sydney Olympics. That was that was pretty huge. Yeah. Um, you know, for me though, I tend not to. I tend not to think of the bigger events as sometimes my favorite things because in some ways they feel less personal. I think some of my favorite gigs with any of these artists would be um, like a, like a hot and sweaty club. You know what I mean? Where the, where the people in the front are like pretty much standing right at your pedal board. That to me is, you know, I mean, you can hear people almost talking to each other. It's it, that to me, it's more intimate. It's, it's definitely more nerve wracking. I don't really get nervous with the big things because everyone's so far away and it sort of doesn't matter how many people are in the stadium because it just sort of feels not connected, if that makes sense. Yeah. But it's interesting you say that my favorite gig of all time, we speak about yeah. fast. Forward, they played here in Perth. Uh, yeah. At the fire in 2007, there was about 50 people there. That's my favorite ever gig. There you go. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And, um, uh, and I remember, I guess I would have been 16 or 17 if we want to talk about like, rock gigs that we both saw ages ago um when warrant came out after they released cherry pie they played yeah. at at uh festival hall in melbourne which is not one of melbourne's big big places i've seen plenty of rock bands of that genre you know whether it's bon jovi or poison or whoever else that played at basically a, a stadium you know or a tennis center or something and warrant just played played little old festival hall and man that place just went off it's it's different when you've got a smaller club with less people and it just is and to me i don't know there's just something about that that i'll just always love more i i just love the, the club gigs more than the the big ones you know so yeah yeah, yeah. no likewise likewise 
also from an international perspective, you've, you've played some big names, Joan Jett, Chris Isaac, and Errol Brown from Hot Chocolate. That would have been an amazing, amazing job with Errol. Yeah, yeah. Um, Errol Brown was an interesting one. That one was where he was out touring Australia and he just picked me up as part of a band to do some TV promo work um, ahead of him, you know, going out and doing his gigs. So unfortunately, I didn't get to actually do the onstage tours with him. But for the TV promo performances, you know, yeah, we uh, I got to play with Errol Brown, which was funny because, of course, growing up in cover bands like we all do, um, we used to play heaps of that hot chocolate stuff, you know, like sexy, sexy, sexy thing. Yeah. And, you know, I believe in miracles. And <laughs> um, but all that, all that kind of thing. But um, uh, so that, so that was a thrill. Chris Isaac was great to work with. So I wasn't in his band, but we did a double header tour with him when I was working with John Stevens and went all around the country. Uh, so obviously we got to interact a lot because we were essentially doing you know, one to 2,000 seat theatres and we we're, you know, all in the green rooms and backstage and stuff and bumping into each other all the time. So him and his band were super lovely. He's such a nice guy. Um, and so, you know, that's one of those things too where we got to listen to Chris Isaac crooning every night for a few months. So that was, so that was super great uh, working with him. But um, yeah, as far as being in, in Australian acts that have toured supporting international acts, I've definitely been really lucky a couple of times. Uh, when I was touring with Vanessa Morosi, we we went around the country supporting Kiss, uh, which was awesome. And so, of course, we got to to meet them several times. I can say that um, Paul Stanley is just so super nice, no ego. So I'll I'll give you an idea. So, of course, when we when we did our first gig. I can't remember where it was. It was at Rod Laver or somewhere in Melbourne, yeah. you know, big, big place. Um, and of what course, was this? So, uh, this was, this would be around, I don't know if I can pin the exact year, but I'd say it'd be early 2000s. So like so 2000 and, the yeah. Rock, rock the oh, actually, 2005, maybe mid 2000s, maybe. Yeah. I, I, let me have a think about that if you want. And yeah. I can get back to you with when it exactly was. But um, I may have seen you at Rod Laver Arena that night. You may have. You may have. But this this will give you an idea of how sweet Paul Stanley is. Is that um, uh, so? We'd all, of course be sitting in our dressing room after we've sound checked and just sitting there, sort of one, wondering if we'll ever get to meet Paul or Gene or anybody else. And um, and this was on the first gig, and then Paul just sort of popped his head into our uh, our green room. He goes, hey, guys, how you doing, everybody? My name is Paul. And we're all like, oh, yeah, we, we know you are. And he goes, I don't want to interrupt, you know, blah, blah, blah. He was so, so apologetic and stuff. And yeah. then we, we were chatting for a bit. And then he goes, you know, do you guys mind if I just come in and sit with you? And we were like, no. So <laughs> he just he just came in and sat on a bench and, and chatted with us for like half an hour. And then after that first time, he would do that all the time. He, so it wouldn't even be us having to figure out or oh, when can we accidentally bump into them in the hallways and, and say hi. He would just come into our dressing room and hang out. And Amazing. And then, um, then there was a couple of times where he'd, say, he'd come in and say, hey, you guys uh, are leaving, are you? Because we're about to sound check. You want to come out? And so... We would go out and sit in the very front row of the stadium while Kiss sound checked, and Paul would just be there taking pics off his mic stand and throwing them to us all in the front row. It was hilarious. And um, for anyone that doesn't know, Kiss never sound checked with Kiss songs. They sound check with the stuff they grew up with because yeah. I guess I guess they get to play their songs enough. So at sound check, they treat sound check like a jam. So they do Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, just whatever Hendrix. Wow. Um, so that's what they sound check. But Paul was like that the whole time. And in fact, um, after we did that run with them, because they really liked Vanessa because she's got that kind of, you know, she's a female pop singer, but she's got that soul rock kind of thing yeah, was, about her voice, you know. And I think that they liked that she was a singer's singer, that she, you know. Anyway, and they, they obviously thought that uh, we were nice guys and all, and all of that. They offered for us with Vanessa to tour around Europe for six months supporting Kiss. Wow. And 
And her management said no, believe it or not. So I, <laughs> that's just one of those things that I will I will be forever um, disappointed by because when we heard that that they turned it down, we were like, are you kidding me? You're you turned down supporting Kiss around Europe for half a year? That is nuts. Anyway, so... Um, but then, and then Taxi Ride around Europe for three months was supporting Tina Turner on her last world tour, wow. which was re- really cool. And I mean, she, what, what a machine she was. She would have been, yeah, early 60s, I think, at the time. And she would do a two and a half hour show almost every night of the week for three months. And, and you know, like getting up on top of the piano in her stilettos. And then she'd go out on, on this claw that went over the crowd like Bon Jovi. Um, I mean, she would do that every at least every second night sometimes consecutive nights for three months so that's hey you know what a great voice, what a great voice. Amazing. and what a great what a great voice and you know obviously her band were completely amazing and uh, hearing all those classic tina turner songs and middle the middle slot we were the we were the opening band of course um because taxi ride at that time were relatively unknown in europe um was John Fogarty doing all the Credence stuff for the first time since Credence broke up? Yeah, because yeah. he w- he wasn't allowed to play those songs as John Fogarty. There was some kind of weird yeah. legal contract thing. So this was the first time he could. So it was him with a great band, you know, Ke- Kenny Aronoff on drums, who's yeah. now out touring with Satch and um, Cougar Mellencamp's drummer. For anyone who doesn't know that, he's amazing. So yeah. killer band. So. We spent three months around Europe listening to Credence songs sung by John Fogarty and then Tina Turner for two hours every night. It was it was um, it was pretty tough fun. Life. An absolute tough life. <laughs> those those moments aren't so tough. That's true. It's <laughs> definitely true. We spoke about recording with Bachelor Girl, but you also appear on recordings by Peter Andre, Guy Sebastian, Ross Wilson, and Christine Arno. Talking about rock royalty there for Australia as well. Yeah. Um, that my session work really just grew organically. It was never something that I sort of orchestrated when I was young. It just happened that, um, uh, again, it's just a string of, I mean, you could almost draw a flow chart diagram on a whiteboard and you could say, ah, so really that, that came through this person, but yeah, the session stuff started flowing in, um, where you would just get to play on somebody's single, uh, or somebody's record. And, um, that was a bit of a different day to now though, because really I sort of caught the tail end of it. Cause as you would imagine the seventies and the eighties, the session user thing for recording was huge. Um, and then in the nineties, it was sort of tapering off just as I started really getting into that scene. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to say now um, that kind of session work in, certainly in Australia, um, I think in other parts of the world, like the session scene, of course, is really pretty big in Nashville still and in other cities. But in Australia, it's more what happens now because I've got a little recording studio at home is um, someone will send you a, a rhythm section track. So I might be just bass and drums and some piano or something. And then I'll just put down the guitars at my place and then send them back. And hopefully I get it close to what, what they've discussed with me. But mostly I can. I've been pretty, pretty fortunate in that. And but obviously there's there's always room for tweaks, you know. So if they say, oh, I really dig what you did with this part, but can we have it a bit less distorted or more distorted or whatever, then you then you can recut it and do it that way. But the um yeah, the the days of going to play on people's records the way it used to be is it's not really that big a thing in this case. And because the, the the truth is because stuff is much less. Uh, certainly mainstream, you know, like FM radio stuff is much less guitar in it for one thing. And then the yep. guitar that is in it is not, is much less flashy. Most producers can play enough guitar that they can lay down power chords and stuff these days. That's, that's what it really is, you know? Um, yep. And they don't need the equipment because now with amp plugins and everything inside the computer, most producers, even if they, in, say back in the 90s, even if they could play power chords, but they wouldn't have all the great Marshall amps or something. So they needed you to just almost bring your amps. And yeah. whereas now with, now with uh, virtual, tech, virtual amps and digital technology, I mean, a producer that has a Les Paul just sitting around in the studio can play probably enough that, to play whatever parts for their pop rock stuff. So. 
Mate, uh, technology is a wonderful thing, but it's taken out the element of uh, great music production, hasn't it? Yeah. The other thing that's that stopped less because now everyone's working in a satellite fashion, you know, like I just mentioned where I'll just work, play the guitar parts on my own at home, is you don't get to interact with people the way you used to. Like you used to, if you got working with someone for the first time and you both really, really got along, you basically made a new friend, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then that person would start booking you for all their sessions. Not, I mean, yes, of course, because hopefully you did a good job, but more than that, they just booked you because they wanted to, because you became buddies. Whereas now that you're doing everything remotely, there's less of that. You don't ever, that, that opportunity to become buddies with someone doesn't happen. Whereas you used to be in the same room together, you know, or yep. you'd finish the, you'd, you'd finish the session, they would go for three hours and then someone would go, well, what are you doing now? And you'd say, Oh, nothing. I was just going to pack up and go home. And go, oh, let's go get a beer. Yeah, so yeah. that I agree with you. That to me is is one of the things that's lost. Um, at the what you gain, I guess, is flexibility and and experience of work. But to me, that that human interaction element is really important, and it's sad that that's gone a little bit. Certainly from the session music world, anyway. Yeah, mate. The the live scene is where you absolutely shine. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of your tribute bands that you've got going on at the moment, but your Dirty Dancing series that you've just wrapped up. What, what was this Dirty Dancing series that I found on, on the internet? So <laughs> what that was, was a fun little thing that was put together that we did some shows in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, yeah. where uh, for anyone that remembers the 80s movie Dirty Dancing with Patrick Swayze, the idea was that for all the diehard cult following fans they would show the movie on a huge screen in these theaters but what they've done is they've taken all the music off the soundtrack so the only thing on the soundtrack now is dialogue um, and then so we as a live band learned all the music from the movie oh. and we would play it along with the movie live so as uh, you know as they'd go into some dance number or whatever instead of the music coming from the movie we'd be playing it and that was heaps of fun, heaps of fun. And, it, you know, it comes with its challenges, as you'd imagine, because everything has to sync up exactly with the movie or, or it doesn't work. Yeah, it can't even be one second out, right? Not even one second, not even less than one second. You just, so everything's to click track in our ears. And um, uh, we've all got like little video screens on the floor that only we can see, which has the movie playing, but it also has like countings and sort of, Yep. visual representations of, you know, when the next piece of music is coming. So it was really fascinating. It was really fun to do. Um, and I got to, you know, I got to get get my 50s, 50s sort of rockabilly and jazz going. So I was playing an old Gretsch hollow body and, and right. you know, do, doing a bit of a different thing, which was fun. So we didn't, we didn't do that many shows. We did, you know, two in Melbourne, two in Sydney, two in Brisbane. I mean, yeah. That was great fun. Fair warning, your Van Halen tribute is probably... Uh, the band that a lot of people associate you with? Sure. It must be crazy playing some of those licks in that tribute show. Oh, it's really, really fun. Uh, that was a band that, uh, that myself and Jerry, the drummer, mucked around with mainly just for fun in the late 90s. Um, and we weren't doing it to do gigs back then. We just said, because at the time we were both touring with Tommy Emmanuel, so you know, when we weren't on the road, we thought, hey, how much fun would it be to keep our, just to keep our chops up and have a goof if we, um, if we picked, like, say, three Van Halen songs every fortnight and went into a rehearsal studio and just jammed them, you know? So that's what we did. We ended up doing that. Uh, we got, because uh, uh, we knew some of the people that ran this rehearsal studio, they could do us a bit of a, a good rate. So we could have the big room. And uh, once every two weeks on the same day, we, we'd get together and we'd do another two or three songs. And we just handpick our favourite songs. We did that for about a year and a half with no gigs. So in the end, we had this huge catalogue of stuff that we used to play. And I've still got um, dat tapes and cassette tapes of our rehearsals from back then. Um, we did do the, we got up to do the Frankston Guitar Festival one year. And I forget which year, but it would have been like 88 or 89, I think. And, um, and that was it. That was the only gig that we ever did. And then a couple of years back, just before Eddie passed away, um, 
I had uh, Rob and Greg from the Melbourne Guitar Show approach me and say, listen, do you, do you want to do something this year on the Saturday? And I said, well, look, it's the, it's the 40th anniversary of the Van Halen 1 record, so why don't there's something fun and a bit different for the punters rather than just playing hand-picked songs? Why don't we see if we can recreate the first record note for note on each instrument and in track order? And, um, and so that's what happened. And we didn't even know that it was going to be filmed and multi-track recorded at the time, yeah. but it, it turned out very fortuitous that it was because um, they ended up giving me the files and I mixed it and did the camera edits and put it up on the, on the YouTubes. And, um, and that video just from doing that Melbourne guitar show thing is got a lot of, a lot of interest. And uh, I think we're up, up, up over 200 and 200 and something thousand views now from something that was pretty quickly put together. We did three or four rehearsals and, and that was it. We didn't even get a sound check. So, um, wow. That's amazing. so yeah. So on the back of that, it's, there's been so many people and especially in, I've made some great new friends in, in America um, and a part of, and now it's a sort of a special guest every now and again on some of their podcasts that are sort of Van Halen based. People are really, really wanting to, to see us tra travel it, you know, and go over to the States and do some shows or wherever else. So at the moment, that's what I'm looking into. We're, we're looking into like, how can we, how can we travel this, you know? So, awesome. and in, and in fact, just in a, in a, in a, sorry, what's that? He's such a revered name, particularly over in the States. So it'd be amazing if you could. We were really, um, I don't know what the, the right phrasing is of this, but I, I'm, I'm very glad that we got to do it before Eddie passed. Yeah. Um, because even, even if we still had been planning it with the Melbourne Guitar Show, had it got put on after Eddie had died, it might have looked like we were. I mean, yeah. you know, it might have looked like we were doing it to sort of cash in on the, the, all this massive focus on Edward Van Halen because he's passed away. But, um, but thankfully, we, we got it in before that happened. But, yeah, that was, a, that was a sad day for everyone, that one, that's for sure. It was, was indeed. Yeah. You play in another couple of tribute bands, Racer X, which is the Racer X tribute, uh, and the Theatre of Dreams, the Dream Theatre tribute. Again, just amazing music to play to yeah um i mean i grew up with the the racer x stuff which is, of course is paul gilbert's thing before he did mr big yeah um, and the the two guitar harmony shred i've always loved and i think i always loved it because i mean the first the first album that i ever bought on vinyl when i was 11 years old was number of the beast and um I see. You know, a, yeah a classic but as we know i mean iron maiden did a lot of harmony guitar mm. solos and so even before i um you know long before i i'd heard racer x i think that that love of harmony guitar leads was already there a little bit but of course paul gilbert and and bruce boilet just took it to a level of shred that was so fun and um so yeah that, that was a bunch of i can't remember how many years ago that was now maybe eight six six seven or eight but uh, I just thought it'd be so much fun to try and do a Racer X thing. So we did. And then we got invited uh, to a recording studio called Pony Music. And they said, look, can you guys do five or six songs, play it live and we'll, um, you know, video film it uh, for, the, for the show Guitar Gods and Masterpieces. And, um, and so we did that. And I'm, I'm really grateful because it ends up on YouTube and, and a lot of people seem to dig it. But that was that was challenging for sure. That really, really challenging because playing that stuff is super hard for everybody. But, um, yeah. but yeah, that's good. And the Dream Theater thing was something we did with Virgil back in the day. Uh, whenever we weren't doing On the Verge, we would do um, a Dream Theater tribute, which of course we just flipped the words and called it Theater of Dreams. But, um, uh, and that was awesome fun too. And because really, it was like on the verge, but we get, got to work with a singer as well. And some, some of that stuff is just oh, still, still in my subconscious. But to me, I suppose the albums we leaned on then were, to pick, choose material from were the ones that were out around that time. So it was uh, Images and Words and Awake and sort of around that vintage stuff. Yeah. yeah. But, um, 
but I've actually been talking to a drummer. I, I've sort of got the itch again, I have to say. I haven't played that stuff for a while, but I really, really like it. And um, I've been talking to a drummer and we're talking about putting something together as like a Theatre of Dreams 2.0. So look out, yeah. watch this so space. Uh, I hope to see you over in, in Perth then for that, Hoss. I'm gonna we will. Yeah, Ab perfect. Absol absolutely. And um, yeah, when, when we do that, uh, I'll talk to you too, because I'm sure you would know some great venues we can approach that would be perfect for it. No doubt, no doubt. Really interested and my daughter will kill me if I don't ask about uh, Australia's Got Talent, X Factor, and Australian Idol. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, from about 2005, I was uh, one of the musical directors of X Factor for about five years or so, and also Australia's Got Talent. Um, and that was great. The, the TV work is, is its, its own whole other challenge. It's got really not that much to do with guitar, especially when you're involved in the musical direction. So... Um, it's a lot of our TV work schedules have got nothing to do with music. It's made only for TV. But so when we had a system where instead of having a band play live on stage, which a lot of those variety shows would kind of have, yep. um, we decided, and obviously with the producer's approval, that we would do it in a way where we wanted it to sound slicker and make it sound um, more like the record. So if someone was singing a... Uh, if someone was singing a John Mayer song, that the music they were singing to sounded like John Mayer. It didn't sound like a karaoke backing or a live band or whatever. So we would have four days a week to record basically a whole album's worth of stuff that we do in, in big recording studios here in Melbourne. And to have it all, all worked out, arranged, tracked and mixed and sent back for their rehearsals, which of course you'd always get notes once they start rehearsing. Oh, now, it, even though they've agreed on the tempos and everything, um, at the start of the week, now they all want something slower or something faster or something louder. So there's always tweaks, but we would work really, really hard. So there would be four of us in the core team that would put it together. And I would say, and not exaggerating, we would, uh, we would sleep about four, four, or five, four or five hours a night, four nights in a row putting that together. I mean, they were like 20 hour days, four days in a row, Matt, just mon monstrous schedule. Um, it's, it's how I lost most of my hair actually, <laughs> but, um, but look really fun. And, and, you know, obviously we get to meet some really very, very talented singers and, and, and even if they're like an Australia's got talent, obviously they might not be a singer. They could be a, some other kind of act. So, so yeah, always great interacting with, with new talent and, and people that you get to, to meet and some of them stay in touch with as well. Oh, that's but, yeah. awesome. but um, so yeah, good, good experiences, but I don't tend to do much of that, that work anymore. Mate, it's been an amazing career, um, but I'm really interested in what's coming up as well. On the 14th of January, there's a bit of a gig called Guitar Wars where you're playing with Tim Henwood and Dave Leslie. What can we expect from that? Yeah, that's going to be awesome fun. And um and that would be something we would love to bring to Perth as well, because I think yeah. the Perth people would really dig that. So what it is, it's, it's myself, Tim Henwood from uh, Palace of the Kings and Dave yeah. Leslie from Baby Animals. I'm sure people would know. So it's the three of us each doing like 30 minutes of pretty much whatever we want, uh, but all guitar based stuff. Right. So some of it might be instrumental, but some of it we, we might sing, you know, it depends. Um, and then, of course, at the end, the three of us all jump up and and uh, and that's when the war begins, you know. So we all put our best foot forward for half an hour and, and put our flag in the ground. And then at the end, we um, we cut heads and and really, obviously, we're just going to be having fun. But it should be a really, really great night of guitar playing. We've got three gigs around that weekend of January 14 booked at the moment. And, um, but, you know, we're obviously going to like see how that goes, but hopefully it goes really well and we can we can bring it around a bit because we'd love to come and do it in Perth, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mate, on top of all of that, you've had a great career, but you also impart your knowledge to uh, students of the guitar as well. Unleash Your Guitar is your, your coaching school. How, how can uh, aspiring guitarists get in touch with you for uh, a few valuable lessons? 
Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, for anyone in Melbourne, I just really, I can, I'm happy doing one-on-one face-to-face lessons at home in the studio. Um, and for anyone not in Melbourne, obviously, if they really wanted to pick my brains about stuff, we can do it on Skype or Zoom or, or whatever else. That's no problem. The easiest way to contact me is actually just my email address, which is just my name, Simon Hosford at Mac, mac.com. That's if anyone uh, wants to hit me up, be more than happy to help. But yeah, I've been I've been teaching since I was about 16. So it's, it's something that, that I really, really love to do because... Uh, there's a great expression that I read somewhere, which is, um, I'm going to get this wrong. I can tell already. The best, the, the best teach. Uh, sorry, the mo- ah, it's gone. I'll think of it. <laughs> it's, it, it's it's something like uh, the the greatest teacher doesn't have the most knowledge. The greatest teacher teaches others how to have the most knowledge. It's something like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm probably getting it a bit wrong, but I but I really believe that you know because had I not had the people around me that I did when I was younger that that were completely selfless in in helping me out, then I wouldn't have got to do some of the things that that I've been lucky enough to do. So to me, uh, knowledge knowledge should be shared, and and uh, watching someone have a have the penny drop moment where they've been working on something really hard for a year and just haven't been out and nutted out. And then you give them that key that what once they turn it, they go, Oh, that's how you do it. That's the funnest thing for me. So that's definitely Simon. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you all of the best, really looking forward to seeing some of the stuff from guitar wars uh, and any, anything else that you're doing, particularly the theater of dreams, Mark two. Over here in Perth, I'm holding you to that. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Thank you for having me, Jock. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, best of luck with it all, mate. Keep rocking. Thank you, brother. Cheers. Thanks.